Well, Mo, welcome here to the podcast, Uncut and Real Raw. Great to have you here. It's an honor to be here, Clint. Well, good deal. Well, Mo, for people that don't know you, your correct name is Mo Brings Plenty from what nation? From the Lakota Nation. Lakota Nation. With my accent, there's no fucking way I'm going to get that right, <laughs> mate. I'll be honest. But thank you for saving my ass. Well, Mo, here's the deal, mate. Um, a lot of people would recognize your face from different projects you've worked on. Probably the one that a lot of people know you from is from the Yellowstone production, correct? Yes, sir. And that would be the main one. That's kind of where I know you from. Yep. I've probably seen your face in other movies and things, but I'm not real good with names. So unless you meet somebody, you don't connect necessarily yep. a name and a face and so forth. But uh, I got a chance to meet you a few months ago. We briefly met and so forth. And I think you've got a really cool story that I want to dive into. And I'm sure the listeners will as well about how you got into the movie TV business, how you got into the consulting, how you got into horsemanship. You're kind of a, a whole treasure chest that I kind of want to get into. But <laughs> yeah. well, listen, let's start from the beginning. How old are you? Let's start right now. How old are you? I'm 53. 53, okay. Yes, sir. Where were you born and raised, Mo? I was born on the Pioneer Indian Reservation, but I like to say that I, I grew up in Lakota country because of my mother, she's from the Shine River Reservation in South Dakota. Okay. And then we had relatives that lived in Rosebud, so I grew up, spent some time in Rosebud Reservation as well. Is that in North Dakota? South Dakota. South all Dakota. in South Dakota, all bands of the Lakota Nation. Okay. And so that's where I spent all my childhood growing up as a kid. So that, that nation that you belong to, is that specifically North and South Dakota or is all over the country? No, it's and just- excuse my ignorance now when I ask these no, questions, because no, I don't that's, know shit. You know no, that's, I mean? all, so, that's good. So is it North and South mainly or mainly is South? It's ma ma mainly, majority of them are in South Dakota, but we do have one of our reservations that it straddles the, the North Dakota, South Dakota okay. state line. But as a general rule, you're in the South Dakota one. Yes, okay. sir. Again, excuse my ignorance, but how many nations is there in America with the American Indians? How right. many na how many nation nations are there? Is it called nations, nationalities? How's the best way to pronounce it? Nations. Nations. So nations. how many is there? Is there a rough number? Yeah, there is approximately about 376 federally recognized only. Uh -huh. And then we have a bunch of more that are just state recognized. Shit, I had no idea it was yeah. that many. Oh, yeah. There was at one time well over 500 nations within this here continent. Huh. And was every was every nation speaking a different language or you guys all speak the same? You no. know, like in Italy, there's some versions of, of the Italian yep. language and, you know, there's different version of the same language. Is everybody speaking the same thing or completely different? Completely different. You're shitting me. Yeah, no, we have, you have your Algonquin language, you have this, what we consider, they consider the Siouan language. I mean, there's so many different, we yeah. all, even our culture, there are very few things that are universal amongst the tribes. Outside of that, our everyday life is so different. Truly? Yeah. That's interesting. That's yep. kind of cool. Yeah, basically, I could say this. We had farmers, uh -huh. planters, yeah. and then we had ranchers, buffalo hunters. Yes. And so oh. do you want to break it up in that aspect? Yeah, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> that's kind of cool. Yeah. So as a kid, did you grow up on kind of a ranch in the city? Tell me about your childhood. I grew up out in the sticks, out in the middle of out nowhere. Middle of nowhere. I tell you what, it was, it was, we were so far out in the middle of nowhere that come <laughs> Halloween time, my little brother and I'd get dressed up it would run around our house and knock on our own door just to say trick or treat. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah, that's it. how country we were. <laughs> that's, that's, that's rough. So obviously horses and animals must have been a big part of what you did. So you grew up riding horses? Oh yeah, horses are a very big part of our everyday life and a very much uh, big part of our cultural identity. Okay, right. Now your parents were very supportive of that, that your dad taught you. Where'd you get your first kind of horsemanship experiences or horsemanship, you know, encouragement to be around horses? Well, my first experiences and my dad, my dad said, all right, just go see what you can get done. Right. There was no how to get on, what to do. He's, if you figure it out, it's mm -hmm. basically, if you can figure out how to start it, you can drive it. Fair enough. Okay. And, and then uh, my real horsemanship came along with um, my uncle Howard Hunter mm -hmm. Sr. Okay. who was um, one of our legendary saddle bronc riders from Kyle, South Dakota. Okay. And I consider him like a father, mm -hmm. you know, he's a distant relation to our family, but yeah. he played a big role in my life as well growing up. 
with the horses specifically. Yes. Okay. Yep. What age would that would have been when he really started? Man, investing? that was probably when I start really getting into all of it. I mean, there was a lot of local boys, guys there that had good pointers mm -hmm. and stuff, and everything was bareback, homemade, you know, handmade halters just out of rope. Mm -hmm. um, but with getting into the real true horsemanship began when I was probably about 16. Did 15, you have? 16 a desire for it, meaning this, is when I was a kid, I didn't know shit about horses. I knew I didn't know shit, but I wanted to know. I right. wanted knowledge, but nobody could fucking help me. My grandmother tried her very best, but we we would like the blind leading the blind, you know, right. so we'd read books and anything we can get our hands on. And anybody that I thought knew more than me about horses, I would ask them questions, which is pretty much everybody. But mm -hmm. something, in, nobody put that in there. Something inside me had a burning desire to learn about this animal and learn how to get along with it, walk with it, you know, have some harmony with it. That was already in me. Nobody put that there. Did you have any similar desire? Did anybody have to push you to learn horses or something you like to do? It was something I loved. Yes. I mean, okay. you know, it I, was a passion. I, I it was it was a passion that I didn't know just like you. Yeah. I didn't know where it was coming from, but it it was something within my DNA that was a driving force to make me want to get closer. So anybody you thought knew more than you about horses, you were asking them questions, stuff like that? I was watching, yes. listening, yeah, yeah, most definitely. I was a nosy kid, I'd, <laughs> yeah. I'd ask questions. Yeah. You know, most kids are a little bit shy to, to step up there and ask, right. I wasn't. I wanted right. to know what you knew, and I thought the only fucking way I'm gonna get it is right. to ask you, and hopefully yeah. you would tell me the truth, you yeah. know what I mean? Okay, so so were you guys homeschooled? There's a there's a public school system. Tell me about that. Public schools. I mean, we rode bus, and it's thirty some miles one way mm -hmm. from where we got on the bus, and we literally had to go uphill to the school bus stop because the pavement end, and we had this big hill between where we lived, where we lived, yeah. and where the bus stopped. So we'd go up and over the hill, and then we'd get off the bus, we'd go up and- So that old story so your parents would say, I had to walk uphill to school yeah, both ways. You actually honestly, did it. That was honestly it. <laughs> And, and Come on winter, now, that's a little bullshit does. there, Mo. No, it's not. <laughs> Honest engine. And so the thing is, too, that in the winter times, we, my little brother and I would hide our toboggan. And, and bury it with snow, and so when we go, when we come back, we can just get the toboggan out and we can ride it down the hill back to the house. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. So, uh, brothers and sisters? I have, I, had, I have three surviving younger brothers. Yes. We bury three of them, and I have one sister. Okay, so there was a total of, uh, what, six? Total? Seven. Seven total. Okay, so seven. larger family. Yeah. So were all of the Indian a relative of yours, big big families, kind of, you know, anywhere yeah. from five to ten kids. Is that a common thing, I suppose, by, is what I'm about three, About three to, three to seven. Three to seven, three to okay, six, seven, right. Yeah. So that was the general rule of it, yeah. okay. Anybody else in your family have a passion for horses, or were you a little bit of the, the wild one that really took a hold of it? I am I am probably the last of my, my family that has a passion for horses. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, no worries yeah. then. So you like school, you hate school, what's going on with school? Because I, I fucking hated it. I hate, I, hate, I hate it, school. Okay. I'd rather spend my day on the back of a horse going somewhere yes. and doing something That's funny. what I was, I was always thinking about, what I could I, what could I do when I got home yep. at the bar? Okay, so we have that in common. Yeah. So at high, you finished high school at 16, 17? I finished when I was, actually I didn't finish my, my best buddy, one of my good friends, committed suicide. Mm. And so it was just right after um, Christmas vacation. And and it messed me up. Yeah, messed you in the head, yeah. Yep. And yep. so I, I went a different route, okay. you know. Um, so after that, you dropped out of school? Yep. And what was your first job? Where'd you go from there then? Um, I worked construction. Okay. And I and I rodeoed on the weekends. Okay. What part of rodeo and kind of got you up? What'd you enjoy? The the bronc riding, the roping? What'd you what'd you get? Well, I, I I love horses, but I was scared of the Bronx. Yes. And so I stuck with the bulls. I tried to be a bull rider. <laughs> that makes no fucking sense to me it, at all. I know I, it. Get on a bull that yeah. will definitely try to kill you or a horse that may kill you. Yeah. Makes no fucking sense. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, but, but, so you like the bulls. Yeah. So you were just doing it on the weekends, construction during the week, yeah. and balls on the weekends. So yeah. you're around 16, 17 at this point? Yeah. How long that period of your life go on like that, that? That lasted for quite a while. Like five years, six no, years? No, longer than that. I was probably into my late 20s when, when I finally got banged up pretty good. Because I, I tried fighting bulls for a couple of years as well. Okay, during yeah. that time? Yeah. Okay. And how'd that work out? 
You know, it was it, it didn't work out so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we we did a couple of um, high school rodeos and stuff, and and that just became you know you get beat up pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And because you don't want them kids to get hurt. No, you know? no. So you're putting yourself at yeah. risk. Yeah. 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 And so then I missed the riding, so I went back to the riding. Okay, so riding then to the bullfight and then back to the riding. Yeah. Were you making any money doing this bull riding, covering man. your entry fees, barely getting by? What's the deal? Man, thank goodness I had a regular job. Yes, that's right. It's yep. a bit like me about performance horses. <laughs> I said I was at a, I was at the uh, Arizona Derby a couple of weeks back, and I was chuckling with a with a horse trainer buddy of mine, and and uh, he said to me, "How's the horse show going?" And I said, "Let's just say I'm real fucking glad I'm not making a living doing this, because I'd be real fucking nervous now about how I'm going to get home." Okay, right. he thought that was the funniest shit in the world, yep. you know. So I, I have fun doing it. I want to be competitive, but right. I'm not right now. But I'm having fun doing it anyway. Right. So we thought that was a chuckle, but yeah, lucky you had a fucking day job. That's, That's right, really absolutely. So if you did this for almost a decade, let's just say from 17 to 27. Um, Nothing's really changed in that point. You're married, got kids during that point. Anything going on there other than you're just a young guy having a good time? Yeah, you're, you're, towards, the end, towards the end of my, my so-called bull riding career, yeah. I did get married and I ended up having a son. Yes. And the last time when I got banged up pretty good, I was holding my kid with one arm and I thought, you know what, I want to be around to play catch with this kid. Yep. Yeah. Be around, go fishing, do other things with him. So I hung her up. Yeah. Yeah. No regrets about that? None, you know, none at all. No, I that's mean, awesome. you know, I miss it, but I, I you know, I still have that the wild hair will yeah. sprout every once in a while. And I think, you know, if I work out really hard, then maybe I can crack out for one more year. Now, now that I know what I know <laughs> and understand what I understand, yeah. uh, maybe that's a possibility. Yeah. And, and, and another thing that kind of got me to step away from that was that I became a pretty bad alcoholic. I had okay. no control. Yep. You know, and and so I had to make a life-changing decision. Yes. And and so I stepped away from it and, and dove back into the traditional way of of our of my people. Right. Okay. And so yeah. Okay. So when you made that choice there, and and one thing I'll comment about the choice about you know no regrets. I think that's a damn good thing when people can hang up a chapter and I think life is just chapters yeah that's all it is it's chapters of your life and when you're young you think you're gonna do this one chapter forever you know what I mean right. but life is just chapters but I think when you can let a chapter go and have no regrets that's perfect timing you that's... did it right at the right time that you enjoyed what you did you'd have no regrets about doing right. it but you sure as shit don't want to go back to it <laughs> you know it's just a as one door my mother always said when one door closes another one will open that's if you're right. just looking for it so that's a damn good thing and in life it, typically i find i don't know if you agree or disagree but chapters kind of last about 10 years as a yeah. general rule chapters seem like they go every decade you, you change you know 20 to 30 30 to 40 40 to 50 right. you know right so when that when that changed when you were holding your son and saying okay i don't want to be an old cripple or dead man for right. that matter right uh what changed in your life as far as you got to make money mo you're, yep. you're trying to eat now okay so yep. lead me through eventually you know it might be years later how you got to do what you do now i'm trying to f piece together for me really and the audience right. as well how how each chapter changed so you got to make money so you're still doing construction what are you doing yeah still doing construction and it actually became a superintendent for okay. a construction company spec houses commercial buildings what are you building i started out residential and wound up in commercial okay fair yeah. enough Okay. Yeah. So you were kind of content with that as a career at that point, or you wanted to do something else but didn't know how to do it? You're about, what, 27, 28 at this yeah. point, correct? Yeah, and you know, here's the thing with it, Clint, is I love numbers, mm -hmm. and I sure in the house wasn't going to get become an accountant sitting in an office all yes. day. Yes, So construction was the next best thing. You work with numbers all the time, yes. having to figure out dimensions, ratio, and yep. all this good stuff, and so I stuck with that. And in fact, uh, in, in my early 30s, I thought, well, I'm going to sell everything off and move to Australia and, and go work as a construction worker over there. I always wanted to go live in Australia for Which whatever way? reasons. I just, yeah. for some, I, after Man from Snorri River. <laughs> that so, changed it. You, it wanted be, you wanted to be it the did. Australian Indian riding <laughs> yeah, down that yeah, fucking yeah, hill, yeah. leaning back on yeah, that bus. Go chase some Brumbies. <laughs> that was an epic movie, wasn't it? Was. it? Especially for when it was filmed. That's when right. that was filmed, 
And I watched that movie maybe two years ago, and I think it was filmed, wasn't it, Mo filmed around 81, yeah. 80? Yeah. The technology of cameras and yeah. angles and, and uh, the, the steady cams and the shit they had back then to film that movie. Yeah. One of the parts, I don't know if you find this, but for me, some of the. I can't watch too many horse movies or TV shows anymore. Like I used to love watching, when I say love watching Yellow, so I enjoyed it, but I had to quit watching it because I, I'm paying too much attention to the camera angles, watching right. the background, what tack they're using. I can't just enjoy the story because I've been in camera, not like necessarily movies, but I've been in front of the camera my whole life. I'm always thinking about how did they shoot that? That's a cool shot. What did they do to do that? So I can't just, now if it's an action type movie, nothing to do with horses, my mind will kind of get into the story better. But when it comes to horses and, and westerns, I, 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 don't, I can't follow the story because I'm following that. But when you watch that man from Snowy River, it was pretty epic how they fucking filmed that. Exactly. Especially that going down that hill. They're not doing several takes on that, my way. No. You get what I'm saying? No, you get I, one no. fucking chance at that. That's and exactly when you really it. look at how he came down that hill, that took some balls. Yeah, no, exactly. I, that's why I loved it. Yeah, it was, it was just made the hair stand up on the back of your yeah. neck. And these aren't stunt doubles, I don't think. That's nope. him Yeah. going down that hill. Yep. You know what I mean? So it was pretty epic to film that and get the audience engaged back 30, 40 years ago, 40 years ago with the cameras they were using. You know no, what I mean? Yeah. See Clinton Anderson and his Down Under Horsemanship Method live. Order tickets now for the Walkabout Tour in Conroe, Texas, November 4th and 5th. For ticket information, visit downunderhorsemanship.com. You're doing construction. How do you, what's the next part of your life that kind of moves on? You know, I, I had a, a falling out with, with my employer and, yep. and the reason why is because then I, I start growing my hair back out. Yep. And, yep. and he, he, you know, in South Dakota, there was still quite a bit of racism that resides there, yep. unfortunately. Yep. And, and so I had to make another life changing decision. Yep. And of course got divorced. And, mm -hmm. and so at that point, and then, um, I kept asking a lot of our younger kids, why aren't you proud of your identity? Yes. Your cultural identity. And a lot of them kept saying, well, we don't see ourselves on TV. And okay. I thought to myself, how the heck am I going to change that? Okay. I know nothing about acting. I know nothing about the industry. And, and so a good buddy of mine told me that in Omaha, Nebraska, the Henry Fonda, Marlon Brando got their start there at a community theater in mm -hmm. Omaha. I thought, shoot, okay. I'll, Loaded up my truck, moved to Omaha, Nebraska, didn't know anybody. But I went there with a mission, and the mission was to learn the industry, learn how to become an actor so that I can possibly be an, an inspiration to our, our younger generation to embrace our mm -hmm. identity, and we can still coexist and reside with everyone yes. else and do things and be just as good, if not greater in so some cases. So you had cases. nobody to look up to that was encouraging you to do this, meaning that no mentors that said, hey, this is just a dream you had, and yeah. you just said, i got to start somewhere. Yeah. See, that's the kind of shit that, that gets me off, is just having the balls to go do yeah. something different. You know, when you had a passion for something, you know, on the bottom, of my, one of the famous quotes that I live my life by is my mentor, Ian Francis, and, I, and he has a famous quote that is on the bottom of every email of mine, and it says, he says, this is his quote, if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way, and if you don't, you'll find an excuse. And I want that on my headstone when I drop dead. If you want something bad enough, you yeah. will find a way, yeah. and if you don't, you'll find an excuse. You didn't know anybody in that industry, nope. okay? You didn't know where to go, what to do, nope. but you, you found a way. Yep. That's what I, I want people to listen to this shit. If there's something in your life you wanna go fucking do, there's something you've been, keeps right. nagging at you, keeps thinking about you, keeps, keeps you up at night, just go fucking do it. Right. You only got one life, don't you, Mum? No, you, you do. You only got one. That's right. So, so if you're gonna do it, Go do it. Maybe you'll fail, but sh you, I, ter I, I think if you go do something and fail, you'll live with that way better yeah. than living to 100 and not having the balls to know if you could have got done it or not. That's exactly Does that it. make sense? That makes like, perfect sense. It's like sense. me with these performance horses. 
I'm starting this at 47. That's too fucking old to be doing, starting this. I'm competing against guys that started their careers when I started down under horsemanship in 1997. Yeah. So I'm trying to catch 25, 28 years of experience on these guys. I, right. So I'm starting too late. So I've given myself from 47 to 57. If I don't get some of the shit I want to get done in that 10 years, it's probably not going to happen, Mo. But you know what I can say? At 57, if I don't do what I want to do, I'll live with that real easy knowing I gave it my best That's shot. That's right. Then That's wait right. until 57 and saying, I never had the balls to go compete. I never had the balls to put <laughs> my right. name on the line. That's right. You know what I mean? That'll eat away at me for the rest of my life yep. because I always wanted to be a horse trainer. I never wanted to do what I do for a living. I right. wanted to be a horse trainer. Now at 47, I get to go back and do that. Well, I'm going right. to do that now. Does that make sense? So, that makes sense? So that's the kind of shit that I love is just having the balls. So you pack up all your shit. Yep. You probably don't have much, correct? You're nope. probably poor at that point. Yep. And you move to where again? Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, Nebraska. Yep. And there's a communal theater Community there. Community theater there, Community yep. theater. Yep, and so I went and took some acting classes. We worked as a welder during the day, painted wheels and stuff like that for heavy So the good equipment. news is, because you had a construction background, yep. finding some day work probably wouldn't have been that hard, nope. correct? Nope. That's, all, that's two things I always say about careers, construction workers and nurses. Yep. <laughs> if you're in the nursing industry, you can get a job anywhere in the world, can't you? That's right. In different industries. That's but right. But nursing and construction, you can pretty much go anywhere. That's right. Okay, that's pretty handy. That was a skill set that backed you yep. up there. It sure okay, did. Okay, so you were doing these classes at night time, Mo? Yeah, I was taking acting classes at night, and then I st there was some productions coming up, so I tried out. Like and auditions, is that yeah, what you call an audition? audition for them, okay. and, and next thing you know, I ended up in a couple of productions there in Omaha, Nebraska. And why would Omaha, Nebraska, of all places, have any sort of movie hub there? Is it a movie there hub? Is, no, it's not it's just a, a local hub. thing. It's just a local thing in a way that, again, Marlon Brando mm -hmm. got his start there. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure yeah. out what the fuck is going on with Omaha, yeah. Nebraska. I yeah. wouldn't have thought that would have been production. Right. Right. But it just happened to start there. Yep, just happened to be a starting point for me. That's yes. what I knew, and so that's Everybody's got to have a starting point somewhere, yep. don't they? That's right. So let me ask you, with the acting, did you really struggle with it a lot in the beginning? Was it difficult? Did it kind of come easy for you? Meaning that everybody's got talents for things right. and things that come easier than others. You, right. know, you know what I mean? So right. how did you feel about that portion? You know, I felt like I, I felt that I was horrible at it. Okay. I mean, yep. you know, and so then I set out to be a, a stunt guy instead. I was like, I can do that. Yes. Because you're so pretty athletic, easy. physical, yeah, yeah. you've been fucking with balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're pretty yeah. agile on your feet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're uncomfortable. The acting's pretty difficult. What was difficult for you? Were you a shy person, Mo? Yeah. Was it remember? For me, I don't know how actors remember their lines. Like everything you see me do on camera, I just make the shit up. It just straight comes out of my head. Like if I have to read a script, like a commercial, I right. sh shit you not, Mo. I sound like I'm hooked on phonics. I sound like a four-year-old. <laughs> jump, Sam, jump. Green ham and eggs. Like if I have to read a teleprompter, right. that's how I sound because right. I, I just can't do it. Where if right. you give me a topic. I can ad lib it yeah. all day long, but I can't read anything and I can't remember any lines either. Right. What about you? You know, I, I think I can, I can, I got to the point where I can re remember lines. Yes. It was, it was finding that, that natural state and comfortableness with those lines. Okay. You know, and, and if we put a lot of, we tend to put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And, and so when we try to memorize lines, then we, it almost sounds like we're just forcing our way through That's those what I'm lines, doing. Yes. you know, yeah. but if we just trust ourselves okay. and you know, as a horse trainer yep. that you, you always have to want, you always want to be in that place of self trust. Mm -hmm. And if you're in that pl place of self trust, then you're going to trust that horse mm -hmm. probably more so than that horse is going to trust you already. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's how you begin to build that relationship. And okay. so it all, that's what I related this whole acting thing to was about what it was like to be around horses. Okay. So horses kind of already was teaching me how to be an actor long before I even knew that okay. I would set out to do that. So once you, you, you wanted to be, so the acting part didn't quite work out as good as you wanted initially. Yeah. Okay. Then you said, okay, you didn't quit. You said, what's another part of this niche? What's another part of this industry I can be involved in? So right. stuntman, yep. correct? Correct. How did that work out for you? Didn't work out at all because okay. of the fact that there's such a tight neck group. You know, I mean, if you have a starting five on a basketball team, you don't want to bring a new guy in good and replace someone else. I yep. mean, so, which I understood. Yes. But I stayed at it, and then eventually, you know, some acting gets begin to open up here and there. Uh, but just before Yellowstone came about, I was I was done. Oh, I was truly? Like, yeah, I was like, all right, I'm just going to stick 
stay at home. We have a small ranch. Yes. And and so I was just going to stay at home, ride horses, take care. You know, I worked for a ranch, a bigger ranch just south of us, 10,000 mm -hmm. acre ranch, big cow calf operation. And so I was just going to stay there, and that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Did you enjoy the stunt work? You know, I did. The okay. opportunities that I had, of course, you know, it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, mm -hmm. it's good to be around that environment and around those guys. And, yeah. and plus, you know, you take a fall and you get paid for it. <laughs> you're not paying to take a fall. Yeah. You're getting paid yeah. to it's take a It's a guaranteed fall. paycheck. Yeah, that's, right. that's right. That's right. Did you have to get, um, and I don't mean to be ignorant, but I know nothing about that world. Did you have to get a lot of training to be a stuntman or did it kind of come natural to you? It I know it natural. sounds stupid to fall off a horse, but did you have to get training how to do that exactly? No, you get pointers. I mean, you okay. know, if someone says, okay, you, here's how you fall off. Yeah. And and they tell you what to, not to do. Yes. And, and so you just listen to that instruction mm -hmm. and you go with it. And yeah. so... It, other than that, it's all you. I mean, it's just basically like the games you played when you was a kid. Yes. That's basically <laughs> it. But you get it. You're actually doing it for a job. Yeah, and you're getting paid yeah. to do it. Yeah. How, how physically taxing is it on your body doing that profession, specifically stunt? You know, the little bit I did, it wasn't bad at all. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't okay. bad at Can all. Can people make a career doing that? Yeah, but, you know, I know a lot of them old stunt guys that are now you know, pretty well banged up, yeah. you know, because accidents do happen. Yes. Just like anything yeah, else. Push you rolls know. on you in the wrong That's way. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And and you get put in the wrong spot and you hit wrong. Yeah. I mean, it all happens. And so those guys are still paying the price for it right now. Yeah. Fair and enough. And so, yeah, it, it, it all depends. I mean, but accidents do Was happen. Was there any other part of the movie business that intrigued you other than the acting and the stunt stunt part of it? Directing. Directing. What did you, you know, like about that? Or what, you know, what intrigued I, you about that topic? I intrigued, well, what, <laughs> what, what, what drew me to that or gave me a sense of, uh, of, of attraction to it is the fact that how can this person bring that to life, that is that, that, that what is living there, and capture that spirit of it and transfer it through a lens and still keep a whole storyline going because especially when you have to cut and you set up for a different scene i mean all of and you're bouncing all over the place how does one person keep that all in order and keep that flow rolling and how so how do they do it is it just natural man, talent it's, it's just a it's a talent that it's a gift it's a gift it's yes. a gift that they have that i it's still it's a storytelling gift that's is that it. right that's exactly mm -hmm. it and if they are in tune with that story you know, it, that story is alive within them, and so they're able to see it. Yes. You know, and so that's what's intriguing about that for me. And, and I want to, it's something I'd like to get into, is mm. a, you know, in that whole aspect of it, and be able to bring to light to a lot of our stories as Native people. That's awesome. Yeah. So the stunt part, after that finished, you were just going to go back to ranch and, and, yeah. and you know, training horses, yeah. that kind of stuff, yeah. okay? So what happened between that and was the next big gig Yellowstone, or how how did you get involved in that particular production? The big, the bit, yeah, the next big gig for me was Yellowstone. Okay. And and I knew nothing about, because I was, what I, the way, what I understood was I was casted for one episode, for the first, yeah, one episode in the first season. And what was your character? What were you supposed I was, to do? I was just Rainwater's driver. Okay, right on. And that yep. was it. Yep. And, and um, but then I met Taylor. Yep. And um, Gil Birmingham, who plays Chief Thomas Rainwater, mm -hmm. said, Mo's a horse guy. Yep. And we had that introduction, that conversation. And Taylor said, well, I got a big buffalo hunt scene coming up next week, and I need some native riders. Are you available? And I said, absolutely. Awesome. And so I went back and I, you know, I grew up watching um, a lot of the old Westerns as well. Yeah. You know, where a lot of them actors, were, you know, they did, they rode their own horses and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they, yeah, they did, did didn't they? Riding. Yeah. You're absolutely right. They and did. so that's, that was one of my, one of my things that I wanted to be able to have as a plate to offer mm. to people is I, I can ride. I know how to do my own stuff. Mm -hmm. I can handle a horse, whatever yeah. you need, I can get it done. That's a well-rounded skill set on a movie set. Yep. yep. Would you agree? No, oh, absolutely. Yes, and not well. just on a movie set, but in life yes. in general. Yeah, that's a good, damn good point. Yep. So from that, so you're on the first season doing that, yep. and then it just kind of grew in, you and Taylor formed a relationship, and he yep. figured out you have a skill set in some other areas, so yep. you just started doing other things. Absolutely. You know, I can handle weapons, I can do whatever needs to be done. Yep. Yeah, and so I haven't followed. Like I said, I watched the first couple of seasons of it, and then again, I 
couldn't follow the story because of just looking at things that I, I see. I, I pay attention to what bits are on the fucking horse, what breast collar <laughs> yeah, they're using. Right, Does the right. bit match the era of when they were right. supposed to be doing it? Shit right. like that. I'm looking at, you know, all the shit, the background, the NCHA sticker that Taylor put in the corner that nobody will notice, but I'll notice, you know, stuff like that. I wish my mind wouldn't go there. That's why right. I had to quit watching it because I couldn't get into the story. But right. obviously, you know, people love the series. It's been yeah. tremendously successful. In your opinion, why do you think it was being tremendously successful, that particular series? Because it's about real life. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, there, and there's so much diversity within that one show. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we like, they like to, from what I hear people describe it, you know, it has so many different layers. Yeah. You can watch, you can watch an episode and then as soon as you're done, you finish that episode, you can go back to the beginning of that episode and watch it again, and you're going to see something new, and you're going to be, and things are going to start connecting. And so it's a show or a program that you can watch over and over, and you're going to still, you're going to get deeper and deeper into it, and you're going to begin to see and understand things. It, it takes you to a whole different level. Mm, mm, and mm. so that's the reason why I believe that it's so successful. Yes. And anyone can connect with it, whether it's a CEO in New York City, yes. or, or, or a horse, horse trainer, trainer. or yeah. anyone, or a native, it don't mm. matter. Everyone's going to connect at some point at, you know, within that show. Yes. And, and I, think it, I think that show has been very culturally um, uh, Impressive, meaning that, what do I mean to say that? Meaning that there's city people dressing like Rip for fuck's sake. You know, there's it's affected people. You know, I think, you know, I, I kind of cuss Taylor and thank him all at the same time that I think between Yellowstone, the Run for a Million production, and Teton Ranch and the American, city people are drawn to the performance horses now, the cutting, the reining, the cow horse, Western lifestyle, ranching, etc. And it, whether they're weekend cowboys or whatever, it doesn't matter. They're still yep. spending money in this industry. That's you right. know, the price of horses in the last four years, Mo, has doubled. Oh, I know. That's it. really what it's done. In the last four years, a $50,000 yearly now is costing you a minimum of 100000 Yeah. okay? And I think it's because there's so much more new blood yep. that came into that sport. And I really think it came into the industry through that show, right. mainly, right. the Run for a Million show that Taylor puts on. And... Um, and what Teton's doing, those three kind of combined right. is bringing thousands upon thousands of new people that right. wouldn't have been exposed to the Western lifestyle yeah. into this industry. Do you agree or disagree? I, I totally agree. I mean, the, the American Hat Company and other hat, Resisto, yes. other hat companies are selling more hats in, yes. in LA and New York than they ever have in the past, you know, 10 years. Yes, that's exactly, he's, I think he's done more promotion and advertising, Taylor, for the Western industry than anybody in history. Yeah. He, he, you know what you think he's done? I think he's made being a cowboy cool again. Oh, exactly. You know, my mentor, Doug Carpenter, he passed away a couple of years ago with COVID. And uh, he said to me, when I was a kid, Clinton, when I went to be a horse trainer, when I went to work for Tommy Mannion when I was 17 years old, he said, being a horse trainer was cool. Yeah. Like that was a cool profession. You wanted to be a cowboy, a horse trainer. It was a cool profession. And he said, somewhere in that, in between then and the next 30 years, it kind of lost some of that coolness there. Yeah. I think Taylor's brought that back. Yeah. That Western lifestyle, yeah. wearing a cowboy hat, jeans and boots, yeah. is not a weirdo now yeah. for anybody that wasn't growing up on a ranch. <laughs> you know, you've right. got city guys wearing that stuff now, right. and it's cool, which I think is great for the industry. It like, is. You it know, is. even though I might bitch about having to pay a lot more for horses now, <laughs> but <laughs> it, on the whole of it, it is good for the industry, that's for sure. <laughs> So um, you've been on the Yellowstone production basically what six seasons now? How long, how many seasons is it for? Been going? Five, five. five. We're right. we're just we still have to finish up the second half of season five. Okay, and is then is it over then? Because I keep hearing rumors it's done, it's not done. Is it going to continue, or you can't say, or where are we at? You on? know, honestly, I'll be straight up honest with you, Clint. When I'm home, I'm home. Mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, I stay in my lane. Fair enough. Keep my blinders on. Well, I, either way, whether it goes on yeah. or not, it's been tremendously successful. It's been a wonderful ride, yes. honestly. And, and I'm, I'm just thankful to even be a small part of what, it. What do you think is your most memorable moment of the Yellowstone production that you were a part of? Filming it or acting in it or 
or just being a part of it behind the scenes? Just all of the all of the above. Okay. I mean, no you know, particular scene in particular that tripped your trigger. I think honestly, well, the one where uh, my character snipered the the rapist. Yep. Uh, that was chasing after Monica. Yeah. That was a very memorable moment. I have two of them. Is that one and the scene that. I did with Rip when I was painting his horse. Okay. That those are the two memorable scenes for me. Yep. And um, of course, Gil Birmingham and I, we have a great chemistry. Yes. We have a good brotherhood. And so yes. him and I, every just working with him is, is such an honor. That's I mean, awesome. you know, it's wonderful. Why do you think his character has been so embraced? You know, because in, there's it, it, it's shown who we are today. Yeah. I mean, you know, and Taylor, you know, Taylor is... He has a lot of desire and a lot of hope for Indian country, mm -hmm. and um, he understands and knows our issues. Yep. And so he really embraced the abilities that we have as Native people, and especially in that character, Thomas Rainwater, mm -hmm. you know, who's very highly educated, you know, and, and he, he's, stra he's strategic, um, he's strong, um, he's all, everything that a lot of Indian people are to who they are today. Yes. And, and so, but we don't ever get to see that aspect because when you hear about Indian country, you just hear about the lows. Yes. You know, there are some very successful individuals who are trying to be a game changer yes. for their communities. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is written in, as Thomas Rainwater. That's awesome. Yeah. So are you kind of, who, who organizes or who helps, I said, well, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to ask is the, the Indian culture how it's portrayed in in this on television do they take that pretty seriously to try to get it right like the costume or the hair or the makeup or you know what i'm trying to ask you i'm no, trying to I, ask I are do. they just winging it or people really want to get it right as best they can no taylor is very adamant about having everything accurate and yeah. he's not the one who makes that decision he's who like, is who does make that decision you i do, do. okay I do. and yeah. how did you now this will sound ignorant but i'll fucking ask it who taught you this? Just growing up in your culture, yep. your dad? Who teaches you mm. all of this stuff? Does somebody mentor you as kids so that this information doesn't get lost? Yep, my grandparents and the elders in our communities, um, Chief Leonard Crowdog, my uncle Roy Stone, all these guys that are spiritual leaders, yes. that were spiritual leaders, they've since passed, but when they were alive, we, they were our teachers, our, our, again, our community, it's just who we are. Mm -hmm. and, and horses played a vital role in that because in what, for us, horses are like angels. Okay. Physical angels. Mm -hmm. They are the bridge between the physical and the spiritual realm. Okay. And so there's a great long history um, with my people and the horses long before the Spanish brought theirs. We have songs that are specifically for the horse, ceremonies that are specifically for the horse. Hmm. And so a horse culture has always been a part of our identity yeah. until the reservation system began. But they are the ones who taught me that history, the true history of our people. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and my family's always been involved in everything because then we come from true leaders of our yeah. people. And, and so I now have that knowledge and understanding. And I'm not the only one, there's quite a few of us. And so whenever, if, if Taylor writes in a, a native story, but it's always gonna be Yellowstone, that reservation is made up. That's a fake reservation. Mm -hmm. yep. But 1883 is not. Yes. 1923 is not. Those yep. are specific tribes that still exist today. And so we have to go to that tribe why we don't have to, but that's the out choice that I make. Yeah, yeah out okay. to them. And so that's your job, is yes. it, to go there and say, hey, we want yep. to do this scene. What yep. do you ask them? What do you want to Well, do? I first let them know what we have in mind. I don't give them every detail, but yeah. I give them a general idea that yeah. so, and then I ask for their language speakers. Yeah. I ask for their cultural, their historians. Yep. I ask for their artisans. Um, What's an artisan, if you don't know? An artisan that? is someone who still makes the traditional wear, made, made clothing, made jewelry, yep, clothing, yep. Uh, uh, jewelry, even hats, like on yep. 1923, um, the, the hats that the native characters wear was made right on a Crow reservation. Okay. There's a hat maker that still makes those reservation hats. And so we, those are the things that we, so if, there's, if that tribe is represented, we go to that tribe to make sure that they, playing a big role and we and I'd like to get the tribal 
council and, and to, the locals to, and, and buy and support. into it and really be a part. Yes. Of it. And are they usually typically very receptive? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, because and this is their. I mean, no one does that. Did you? You know, there's other org native organizations out there, but they want to be the go-to and they're yeah. going to make the decisions. I mean, no different than mm -hmm. what it's Hollywood politics. has done for yes. many years. Yes. yes. Where for us, Taylor and myself. We could do the opposite. We was like, nope, Taylor says, no, here's the tribe that we have. Yes. Okay, so now I go make that connection. Yeah, that's And awesome. we bring those people in because it's their tribe. They're going to be the representatives. Mm -hmm. I'm just the go-to in between. If they, have a, if they think that something isn't right, they're going to tell me, and then I deliver the message. So it's basically I'm just the messenger boy. That's and right. so each tribe is represented, and they're doing their own representative. Do you try themselves. to use people in that tribe as extras or people Absolutely. as writers? And Absolutely. Et yeah. and, and, if, and if their reservation isn't close enough, depending on where we're filming, then I'll, I would reach out to the surrounding tribes yeah. that are there and see if we can bring them in mm. as extras and stuff and get them involved. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really, really good. Yeah. Um, is, have you have you learnt things from the other tribes and, and nationalities that surprised you at all or no. you didn't know? I suppose you can't know everything, can you, Mo? When no. there's 300 and something nations. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's yeah. a lot, isn't that it? Is. That there's is. got to be some cultural differences, when you, especially when you said, when I asked you in the beginning, they're not all just the same. Right. You know? you know, so I'm learning. Some, I'm learning a lot of stuff myself. Yes. And and so of course it's very been it's been very educational. Mm. And but I also get to see the state of what some tribes are in right now, mm -hmm. and 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 how much their culture has declined. Mm -hmm. And so how Taylor is trying to reverse that as well through yeah. his writings. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I will say this about Taylor Sheridan very respectful mm -hmm. to every culture. There's two cultures in this country that have been were fading pretty bad until mm -hmm. Yellowstone. Okay. And that was the cowboy culture and that was the Indian culture. The Indian, the, the native culture got a, re, re, a breath of fresh air when Dances of Wolves came up. It did, didn't it? But then there was a huge gap, gap in between until Yellowstone. Yes. And so I, I have to tell Taylor Sheridan, thank you so much for what he's done for us in, in the Indian country. Um, do you think I hope, I don't know if you know, the. none of us know the answer, I suppose, the only person who doesn't know is Taylor, but he's making the Western lifestyle cool again. Mm -hmm. The other, sh I've seen the other shows and I like them. Mm -hmm. I like them quite a bit, actually. Um, uh, you know, it seems like, do you think they're the only type of themes and movies where the Indian culture can kind of come through and be a part of the characters? Is it the old Western? Is it, is it, are you, unfortunately, are you pigeonholed or stereotyped that that's the only places in Hollywood where the movie, where you guys and the Cowboys can come together? Is that the main theme? You know, Westerns? I, <clears throat> um, Taylor's right, his writing's so much different. Okay. You know, we're, we're not always the villains. I mean, yes. we have our moments, just like the Cowboys aren't always the villains. That's they right. have their moments. I yep. mean, and, and there are times that we set aside our differences to come together to fight a common enemy. Yes. You know, and, and so Taylor's writing is so unique. Yeah. And and that's what I love and respect about his ability, you know, and his gift. Yeah. And and so it's just amazing. See what to me is funny about, you know, you can talk about racism and everything in the world, but when when your kids we don't give a fuck. We just like playing. That's like in right. Australia, our famous, our favorite game as kids was Cowboy and Indians. But yep. one day you want to be the Indian, the next day you want to be the Cowboy. That's right. Every team was cool. Yep. You wanted to change teams <laughs> every fucking day. That's it was right. an adventure. That's right. And somewhere along the line after that, people start, you know, picking a team permanently. But it really is true. Kids don't give a fuck what color right. they are. They, no, they just yeah. care about playing. They That's care right. about being cool and having fun That's together. Right. And right. I think the more that adults can keep that mindset, the better everything gets, you know what I mean? Yeah. What do you think is the biggest killer in your, in your culture? What is the biggest killer for tradition uh, or keeping your culture alive? Our Achilles heel is ourselves. It is? Yeah, yeah. It, and, and it, it, there's, there's so much um, self I guess, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's when, uh, the worst racism I ever felt and experienced was when it came from my own. Truly. Yeah. That is the worst. Yeah. And, and when, you, when, you, when you endure that type of judgment from your own, because you're both in the same struggle. Yes, right? yes, you're in the same boat. That's right, you're in the same boat, but you're, you're hating on each other, you're, you're beating up on each other. Um, and especially when since social media, yes, 
you know, it's became even worse for our younger people. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard, it's hard to, it, so we are self-destructing. Yes. And, and if we understood the damage that we are doing to ourselves by doing these things and, 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 and hating it on each other yeah. and saying bad things about each other. Yeah. My grandparents, I will say this, there's, this is the difference between myself and, and so many others is that I grew up in a community. Mm -hmm. I come from a community. I don't come from a clique. Yes. And 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 if when you when you come from a community, you have more of an open mind. You have more of an ability to be accepted, and and get to know people first yes. before you make a a, a a false judgment. Yes. You know, and, and so that's the difference, and and that's the way I grew up in a tradition, a good traditional way, and and a good cultural way, and and so I try to carry that on and pass it on to our young people. Yes. I mean, in 1923. We went to a reservation that these kids probably thought they'd never ever have an opportunity or chance mm. to even be on a movie set or yeah, a television yeah, yeah, yeah. set. But we went there and we had an open casting call and, and all these little kids come out of the, these communities <laughs> and they play and they did an amazing job on 1923. Tell you what, let's, let's break right there. We got to take a little break here and put new, new batteries in. Uh, I want to pick it up with that 1923 and the casting. This okay. is cool, but you're getting kids involved yep. in doing something. Let's break here, but remember that point I will. that we'll bring up. This is awesome. Good All job, right. Mo. Thank you. Clinton's grabbing a cocktail, and we'll be right back. Get yourself one and enjoy this short clip. Nothing would please them more than to see this old piece of shit in a coffin. Oh, they want to drive a steel knife down a stupid fucking throat And they talk about it quite often Right on, more hate mail. This is short to the point. We got numb nuts. Exclamation point. Chris Wolf. <laughs> Another one. His accent is like nails down a chalkboard. Beth Bradley. You must know my ex-wife. She said the same thing. Next one. Arrogant personified. Motherfucker, you, you, this is arrogance personified. You're using way too big a language for me. I don't have that kind of vocabulary. Brian Bailey. Uh, next one. Don't ever listen to an Australian pretending to be a cowboy from Texas. Well, I never pretended to be a cowboy from Texas. I left Texas, but I am an Australian and I've lived here for 25 years and I've lost a lot of my accent, picked up some accent from some other places. But here's what I say. When you live somewhere for this long, you're bound to pick up some of their traits. But love living in America. This is from Joshua Rawlings. Good to see you, Joshua. So, Mo, right before the break, we were talking about, was it 1923? Yep. Correct? And they did the casting call. Yeah. And the little kids come out. Yeah. So we went to the Flathead Reservation because it was a slow, the closest reservation to where we were filming. Yep. And we put out this big old casting call. And all these kids were coming, and, and again, man, they were little guys to, you know, I mean, they were all sizes, and, and it was so amazing, and it was so en enlightening. And all I kept thinking was, I owe this to Taylor Sheridan, That's this awesome. opportunity to bring all these kids on the set. And their parents brought them, and they all showed up, and we bust them in. We bust them in. Oh, there was that many. Yeah, people. there was that many. They were bust in by the production, and so Paramount and 101 Studios all played a hand. And and again, this is all goes back to Taylor's seriousness and 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 desire to have everything accurate. That's awesome. And so it was wonderful. I had a great time. Those kids had a great time. I was so proud of them. Do you think do you think this type of work is inspiring kids and your nations to want to do what you're doing? Yeah. Like yeah. role models, like maybe I want to be an actor, maybe I want yep. to be a stuntman. And and maybe I want to become a journalist, or mm -hmm. maybe I want to become a meteorologist. Yes. I mean, which I keep telling them, become a meteorologist. That's the one job you can really screw up on, and you still are going <laughs> to be exactly, employed. That's exactly right. So, it's either that or a fucking politician, man. Right, politician right. or weatherman, you can fuck up every day, and you still get a paycheck. That's right. You cannot get fired. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that I that's really funny. encourage them. But, you know, and now... A lot of them, some of them are wanting to become camera people. 
Yes. Um, some of them want to get involved in hair and makeup. I mean, there's yes, so many there different aspects. There is a lot. That is right. There is a huge yeah. part. There's a lot more to the movie than just in front of the camera, isn't that's it? That's right. Yes. That's right. That's a damn good there's point. There's so many jobs and opportunities behind the camera. I mean, we have a native uh, guy who works with our props de department. Yes. I mean, we have people that are now, I mean, Taylor's really built up a lot and he's making space. And, and I always reference to Taylor because it's true. If it wasn't for Taylor Sheridan and he allowed the suits to, to, to dictate which, yeah. what he needed to do, yeah. I wouldn't be where I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but he's like, absolutely not. This space is theirs. And he allows us to occupy that space that he's set aside for us. So for people, young people, regardless of what nationality, white, black, Asian, who yeah. gives a fuck, regardless, how do kids or how do young people get into quote unquote the movie industry? Is there apprenticeships? If they don't want to be an actor, so to speak, right. but they want to be a cameraman, they want to be audio, they want to be makeup hair. Is there, I don't mean to be ignorant, but is there school for it? Do they just become an apprentice and, and basically follow somebody around for four years and say, oh, well, like my apprenticeship, I got my first job as a horse trainer for free. Cause I said to him, I'll work for free. Yeah. I'm that desperate to learn what you know I'll follow you around seven days a week, work 14 hours a day if you'll just let me do it. You don't have to pay yeah. me a cent. Yeah. So he gave me a job. Yeah. Now from that, I make a lot of money from that. It's two right. years now. But right. that's, how, that's how I got started. I was yeah. willing to work for free. How do young people break into the entertainment industry? There's, there's a couple different avenues, and that's one of them. You know, you get involved, you volunteer your time. I mean, you all have to get st get started. Get somewhere. started somewhere, yes. And 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 whether you're you're able to stay in school, yep. And go to a college that offers that avenue for you, and or you show up on a movie set somewhere and ask for a job, volunteer your time. That's it, volunteer. You know, yes. go to a theatrical center or a community theater, and and ask to volunteer to help build their sets. Yes. You get started somewhere. And, and again, like you said, you know, if you really want something bad enough, you'll find a way. That's right. It reminds me of something. I had a girl, this is going back 20 years ago, from California that was showing up to my tours. And she was probably only 14, 15 years old. And I noticed she started hanging around at the end of the tours. She would hang around and offer to help pack up our tour and stuff like that. Well, I noticed that she would come to as many tours as she could come to, and I kind of noticed her face. And this girl was a hard worker. I mean, she'd get in there, she'd lift boxes. You could tell she was she was there to work and be a productive team member. And um, and she just kept showing up and showing up. And she got to the point where I couldn't ignore her anymore. Like I got to hire this girl. Right. You know, I got to do right. something with her. I don't know right. what to do with her, but right. she's such a hard worker, so enthusiastic. So passionate about my company and down under horsemanship, right. I eventually offered her a job as uh, working on the phones. This is before we did a lot of internet sales. You know, I used to have like a call center right. where people would buy all my products on the phone. She got so good at selling. That was her niche. She was such a good natural salesman because people liked her. She was kind. She was funny. She was engaging. She was very charismatic. People loved this. She just had a likable personality. Uh, when she left me, she was my lead salesman making a hundred grand a year. Wow. The other salesmen were lucky to make 50 grand. Wow. She was making a hundred grand a year. God yes. Dang. That's yes. Desire. Allison, her name was. Yes. She was that a great, and, she, and she's still in sales. She works for radio now in Fort Worth. Right. And oh, I bet she's making at least a couple hundred grand a year right. now with what the job she's doing now. But what I'm saying is that started from her volunteering. Yep. That started from her busting her ass. Yep. She didn't walk up to me and say, give me a fucking job and pay me. She said, what can I do for free? What can, yeah. you know, we, we, got, we had a clean installs in the beginning. Right. She said, can I do anything? Okay, well, here's a pitchfork, clean a stall. Right. Not just clean it, but clean it well. Yeah. Put passion into it. Right. Sweep the alleyway. When yeah. that's done, I walk back 10 minutes, you know, a few hours later and she's got the buckets emptied and scrubbed out and filled back up with fresh water. You don't have to tell somebody that, that's ambition. Yeah. So there's a lot to be said I get school is school and I'm not, you know, I'm a little bit anti-college and anti-university as, as a general rule. Okay? We got that in because, And maybe I'm just biased because I never graduated high school. I, I, don't, I left high school at 15, so I have no fucking education at right. all, technically. But I made a lot of money in my career because I had passion and I was a workaholic. So maybe I'm more a lack of anti-education because of that. But there's a lot to be said about education in, in the trenches. Yeah. 
side by side. Yeah. You know, the two years I worked for free, even though I didn't get paid, I pe technically got paid millions because yeah. it was my foundation. Yeah. So, so yes, there is a lot to be said about showing up and saying, can I work for free? Can I volunteer? I'll, I'll clean the garbage cans. What do I need to do to prove to you? And here's what I think, Mo, I don't know if you agree or disagree. Employment now, employers are so desperate for young people that want to work because there's such a lazy fucking streak now in yeah. our society. Yeah. I don't give a fuck if it's white, black, Asian, yeah. what it is. Yeah. It doesn't matter what color you are. Yeah. There's such a laziness now in young people. When you find a kid that will work its ass off, they just stand out. Oh, yeah. You stand out very, very quickly. Yep. Because the rest of them are average. That's right. So when you you step in up here, you just mow them down. Yep. So I would say to a young person, do what you do. Volunteer. Be a yep. grip. Be a lackey. I don't give yep. a fuck what it is. Start That's at right. the bottom with a smile on your face and do every shitty job nobody else wants <laughs> to do. Right. And somebody will notice you, correct? That's right. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think about it now. I mean, I hired, when I was working on that big ranch, we hired some young folks. Mm -hmm. Good talkers. Yes. I mean, boy, they can talk a good game. Yes. And when it came down to it, it's like, whoa, these guys don't, especially when the weather got cold. Oh, yeah. I yeah. was left by myself feeding 700 head cattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and here's these young cats. And I'm like, when I was a kid, yeah. man, it didn't matter. You need your saddle carried, I'll carry it. Yes. And I'll carry my own. Yeah. All at the same time. I'd figure out a way. And it's just, the, the, just heart because I'm the same way. If you, if you have no fear of work, you're gonna go a long ways. You can, you can fuck up a lot of things in life, yeah. but if you get this one part right, I think, Mo, if you have a work ethic, you can fuck up a lot of things in your life, but if you don't fuck that one part up, yeah. and you're willing to work 12 hours a day, you're willing to bust your ass six, yeah. seven days a week, you almost can't fail at life. No. You get what I'm saying? Obviously, yeah. drugs and alcohol will fuck you up for sure. Yeah. But if you can work, yeah. You, you can do a lot of mistakes in your life and still be pretty damn successful. That's right. Because that's the one thing that you can't teach people to do. It's no. either in them or it's not. That's right. It's either in them or it's fucking not. I, I truly agree. believe. I agree. You know? I'm raising, uh, we're raising my, one of my nephews right now. And, and we've had him since he was about eight or nine. And uh, now he's 16. And the first day I asked him, I said, do you like video games? He said, yeah. I said, okay. So I grabbed the rope and dummy, put it outside, and I handed him a rope. I said, here you go. This is your video game. <laughs> and he goes, well, I don't know how to do it. I said, well, you figure it. You'll figure it out. Just keep playing it. You'll figure it yeah. out. And now he is learning about horses. Mm -hmm. He knows how to work cattle. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows how to sort. I mean, he's someone that I could depend on now. Yes. At 16. And so... Well, earlier when I said that I was probably the last of my generation, I, at this point today, I, I feel that he's not quite at that level, but he's getting at that yes. level. And, and he's, losing his, he, he's losing his fear of himself mm -hmm. and gaining more comfort and, and, and confidence within himself. And that's all due to the horses that he's been working with and yes. riding. Yes. And so, yeah, I got bucked off, oh, about three weeks ago. And I said, it don't matter. You could be the greatest horse, horseman. It still may happen. Yes. By accident. You know, I was riding a, a colt mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I had him in a round pen. Everything was fine. And I thought, well, I'm going to take him out. So I took him out in the pasture and one of our calves was laying in a cedar tree and I didn't see it. That mm -hmm. was my fault. Mm -hmm. And so the calf jumped up because it was sleeping and we scared it. And so the horse jumped to the, jumped mm -hmm. to the side, of course, yeah. you know, it stood me up on yeah. one side and it happened. Mm. But you know, it's it. You got to be able to take those falls and just get yourself back up mm -hmm. and keep going. Yeah. You know, and I and I told him, I said that's going to be the same thing in life. People are going to tell you no, mm. but just keep getting back up and keep working and keep trying, and you're always going to be successful. See, you brought up the point about you know some internal conflict within your own nations as as yeah. not supporting each other. Okay. Yeah. My question to you is 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 it really your thing? Because I think it's a human thing. Yeah. I don't even really care what color you are. I think humans have a tendency to drag each other down. Yeah. You might think it's just specifically in your thing. I've heard it like, like you know, I follow a lot of politics. And yeah. I'm big time conservative. And and I, and one of the guys I love listening to on YouTube, I watch YouTube all the time. His name's Brandon. I can't remember. He's a, he's a black guy. He has a cool channel on YouTube. And he says that about in the black community, that when a black guy is doing good, other people want to tear him down 
and talk shit about them and shame them and you know all this kind of stuff. My my answer is, don't you think it's a human thing? Yeah. Because I'm fucking white and people still hate me. Yeah. You get what I'm trying well, to say? I do. I, I'm not. I, I'm not saying. I'm just saying, I just think it could be a human thing. It is. Rather than just always just a certain race of people. Yeah. Pe- I, I, that's what I love about the podcast. See, when I'm around, I'm a bit of a weird person. Well, let's just say it. I'm real fucking weird, okay? <laughs> but how I'm weird is that I get energy from other successful people. Right. Jealousy is the last thing that enters my mind. When I get around people with more money than me, yeah. more successful than me, smarter than me, more harder worker than me, it lights a fucking fire yeah. in me. I just want to go attack something. Yep. The last thing I want to do is tear them down because right. I don't know why. It's just all I've always been like that. But Same I don't way. think a lot of humans think like that. Do you agree or disagree? No, I that? totally agree with you a thousand percent. I mean, I don't know how I got right. like that or why I think like that. Right. But that's that's why this podcast has been extremely successful because I've got people walking up to me at horse shows, Mo, but don't know me and saying, thank you for the podcast. I love the guests. I love what they're saying. It's motivated my life. I'm making more money now. You know, I was down on my, like one guy wrote a comment on YouTube, but he said he had $700 in his bank account. He's driving to Florida for a job. Doesn't know if he's got enough gas money to get there, (laughs) but he remembered Rodney Carrington driving around the country with $10 in his pocket, not knowing if he can get to the next show. And he said that, listening to that made me fucking keep pushing. Yeah. You you know what I mean? That's, That's the whole point of the podcast is to build people up. Right. To be more successful in your life right. and, and not tear people down. No, I think, honestly, my honest opinion for me, I think it, and for, maybe for you, maybe I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but I think horses had a lot to do with mm-hmm. that. I yeah. really do. You yeah. know, we, we understand and, and we are humble enough because in horse, horses taught us how to be humble. Oh, yeah. And, and how to stay calm. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's the thing. Is I think it's just a human thing. Mm-hmm. It's a human issue, especially in this day and age. Yes. You look and at maybe society, social media has made it worse. It is. You know There's what I mean? There's so it's much easy. segregation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So much. Yes. And, and we have to figure out a way that we all, there is a common ground that is a much larger space where we actually have elbow room. But we're all trying to fit on this one little pinhead and we're all tight and we're trying to make our way and be the top dog. Mm-hmm. I, I prefer standing over here where there's a lot more space and we can all, yeah. we're all related in that aspect. One thing that I've noticed since doing the podcast, the stories that really resonate with people, the, the listeners that I, the, and I, I keep hearing feedback in person. That's how I mm-hmm. say this is that people walk up to me and tell me these comments or stories. The one thing that is a common denominator that people resonate with is people's failures, not in a glorious way, but is in a human way. We're all human. You know, I have a joke. We all shit ourselves every once in a while from coffee in the morning. We're all human. I don't give a fuck how how famous you are or how much fucking money you make. Somebody shits themselves at least once a year, you know, and I joke about it, but it's not really a joke. And when people come on this podcast and talk about their failures and their successes, you're more relatable. People can relate to you like, okay, this guy's famous, but he's human too. We all get a bloody nose. We all fucking do some dumb shit from time to time, but we learn from that shit and we move on. You know, that's, that's the part of the stories that everybody loves the most is, is you see at the end, the money and the fame or what you've accomplished, but there's a whole journey that got you there. That was pretty ugly at times, pretty difficult at times, but there was something that kept pushing you forward. Right. You know what I no, mean? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's even like right, working with horses. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't have to know how to handle the horse. Mm-hmm. I have to know how to handle myself mm-hmm. before yeah. I can connect with the horse. Yeah. And that's always the, the biggest thing and the biggest issue that we all face, I, I think, mm-hmm. as human beings, is that we don't know how to handle ourselves. And that would be, that could go under the category, Mo, of, of knowledge is power. That's right. You know, when I was, I left a, my high school at 15 and started my apprenticeship at 15 and when I was working for Gordon McKinley, I was having a bunch of trouble with a horse and, and I was obviously frustrated and upset and it wasn't going well. And I could see him kind of watching from a distance and he rode over to me and he said, you want me to tell you what's wrong with that horse? And I said, yes, tell me what's wrong with this son of a bitch. He said, just tie it up and go up the house and look in the mirror. The fucking problem's there. Oh, wow. And it made me angry, yeah. of course, but right. he was right. I was the problem. Yeah. So I always have a saying, frustration Frustration begins where your knowledge ends. That's so right. So when you run out of knowledge, frustration takes over. That's right. Well, I don't think it's just lack of knowledge with horses. It can be a lack of knowledge in life. Yeah. When you don't right. have knowledge in life, how to handle people, how to handle situations, it's easy to get angry. It's That's easy right. to get mad. 
You know, right. I've noticed as I've got older and older and older, I don't burn anywhere near the bridges I did in my 20s. Yeah. You no, know, in my I 20s, agree. you piss me off, I just tell you to fuck off and we're that, done. Now right. at 47, I'll think that, but I'll think, eh, I'm going to cross your bridge one day. I, I, know, I know I will eventually, could be 10 years from now, right. there'll be a big deal. Come right. by my desk and I'm going to have to sit across the table from you and negotiate. <laughs> so I'm just going to smile and say, you know what, I'm ashamed this didn't work out, but I wish you the best in life and blah, yeah. blah, blah. I don't burn those fucking bridges no Right. Because I know I have to cross them. It's always funny. The bridges I've found in my life, Mo, that you think you'll never need or have a need in the world to cross are the ones that you always yeah. have to cross. Yeah. Oh, it's like a sick It's a sick joke on, on humans. Do you agree yeah, or disagree? Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> True that. You know? So it's more knowledge is power. And that's what people are getting out of the podcast is the stories that are giving people inspiration to keep going. How do you know what it takes to become successful? Talk to someone who's done it. Clinton Anderson became a multimillionaire by leveraging his passion for horse training into a global brand and media empire, starting with nothing but the change in his pocket and the will to succeed. In doing so, he revolutionized an industry and became a celebrity. Now, you can put his experience and advice to work for your business. With Clinton Anderson's business consultancy, you can tap into Clinton's unique perspective Hear his straight talk and get his no-nonsense advice. Just imagine yourself armed with Clinton's hard-earned knowledge and entrepreneurial spirit. So whether you own a ranch or any sort of business at all, we invite you to discover the transformative power of Clinton Anderson's leadership and innovation in your business. Call 1-888-287-7432 to take your business to the next level today. So what are the projects you're working on now that you're pretty excited about? Well, right now we are uh, we just finished up Lawman Bass Reeves, um, and that's I, I'm really excited about that. Okay. What is it? What is the story? What is It's the... about Bass Reeves. He was the first African-American um, U.S. Deputy Marshal okay. in the 1800s, and he, he was around what they called the deadline, but it was the, the, the line, the territory, the boundary, between Indian Territory and Fort Smith and okay. you know Arkansas here. He was all through this area. And so um, it's really exciting to, uh, I'm really excited for the, for the project itself because yeah. from what I've seen, it's gonna be amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. And who's running that show? Who's the director on it? Who's? Uh, Chad, Chad, um, oh, I forgot Chad's last name. I have it on my phone, but no, I understand. he's the UPM on that and he did a great job. Yep. Um, and and Christina, um, she d did directed some episodes on Yellowstone yep. last season, and she's an amazing director, a great gifted individual, and she has also has a young Native apprentice that's working with her, and uh, because that's what she wanted to do, and reach out to the young people in Indian country, and so we looked for one. I sent her a bunch, and she whittled down, got them down to the one that she's been working with on Yellowstone and this project. Um, and so a lot of good things are happening, you know. Is it hard in your industry, is scheduling a major, um, uh, I don't know, I'm also gonna use the word, word frustration, but is that a hard thing to do? Schedule your shoots and schedule where you're going to be, especially if you're working on, do you work on multiple projects at once or one per year? Or how do you schedule your life to be in this, what's I, the behind this? What does behind the scenes look like for you? I, I let I have a team of people that do that. Okay, and so I let them handle all. But of you, that. is it true that you're working on multiple projects yeah. per year? You just don't get to do this one job for yeah. a year. You've got to do several things, yeah. correct? Yeah, I'm doing several projects. I mean, there was at one point we had Yellowstone going because I did all the consulting yep. for that this past season, 1923. Yep. And then we were starting, we were in pre-production with Lawman Bass Reeves. So I was making the trips down to Texas, mm -hmm. getting in meetings, you know, yep. being part of meetings with that. And so I was on three different projects at one point. And then we finished up with uh, Yellowstone and I was on two, finished 23, stayed on one. Yep. And then, you know, now it's just, trying to get things done at home. Yeah. And do you so, try to keep cult started at home? Are you doing any horse man, training in between I, or you just don't have time? I don't right now. I want to, mm -hmm. but it's just so difficult because you know, yes, once you get started, yes. yeah, you can't stop. Yes. And and so I I have to 
pull back on that. Yeah. And I miss that that aspect of it. Oh yeah. You know, I yeah. want to get back to it again because it makes me it gives me life. Yes, makes you, you feel know? good. It does. It yeah. does. It yeah. does. My grandpa always said, you don't see what you can make that horse do, you see what you can accomplish together. Yes. And so that's the one thing that I miss about being at home. Yes, I'd agree with that. You know, I I'm training more horses now, Mo, to be honest, than I have in my whole career. Oh, wow. Because I'm only doing three tours a year now. You know, oh. for a decade, I was on the road 45 weekends a year. Thursday yeah. through Monday for 10 years, 45 weekends a year, I was gone. Yeah. You can't train a horse mm -hmm. three days a week. Nope. You, you get what I'm trying yeah. to say? So I'm actually getting back to what I wanted to do, which is train horses every day. Oh, I don't train yeah. people anymore. I train, you know, 10 horses yeah. a day. And I love to do it. But you're right, you don't, you have to go where the money is, obviously. And yep. most people that are listening to this have got day jobs. Yep. You know, you got to be able to afford them before you can keep them. That's right. So you go to your day job and make money and try to pay your bills, and then you fill in your gaps yep. with your horses and your lifestyle and that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is there any particular niche in the horse industry that trips your trigger? Meaning that, do you really love starting colts? Do you like showing cutting horses? Do you like reining cow horse? You might like it all, but is there anything in particular for you personally as a horseman that trips your trigger? Starting colts. Starting colts, yes. Yeah. What do you like about it? I just love, I love to watch our relationship grow. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the biggest thing, you know, trying to figure out and communicate with the, you know, because we speak two different yeah. languages and, and figuring out how to maneuver around all of them mm -hmm. you know and and once i find that place and then we can start building relationship that's the most exciting part yeah i remember that i can yeah. identify with that yeah you know i think it can comes and goes and once you accomplish for, for me at least once i accomplished something got really good at it it got boring yeah but then i needed a new challenge yeah you know what i mean yeah. one question i've got for you that i've always wanted to ask and this is ignorant on my part only knowing as a kid you know the movies and mm -hmm. cowboys and indians and the movies but how did the Indians traditionally break horses. Was it literally bareback and riding them in a, in a hackamore? What, what is traditional, you know, going back 300 years ago, right. how would they start horses? Everything was groundwork. Okay. Everything was groundwork and there was a lot of groundwork that, and, and okay, when we, when we were born, this, I'm going back yeah. to tradition here. Mm -hmm. So the moment an infant's born, so what they will do is after all the women that are still in their birth giving years yeah. all held that child before the mother held that child. And the only reason why they did that is to let everyone know in that village that they were all mothers again. And so once they were done with that, then they would all take the, the child out amongst the horses and they lay the child down. And one of those horses, whether it be a colt or, or maybe a four year old or a five year old, one of those horses, could do, they'll all come up and investigate but one of those horses is going to stay there and nuzzle that horse and, uh, with that child and stay with that child. And this is a newborn? Yeah, Truly. this is a newborn. This is how you begin that relationship. That's and so there's a relationship that that horse is committing itself yes. to that individual. And so as that child is growing up, and so when we when we get horses, we had horses for, that were specifically for buffalo hunting. Okay. We had horses that were specific for, for going and scouting. Yeah, for hunting. And patrolling. Yeah. Uh, we had horses that were for moving camps. I mean, there were specific horses. Each of them that were trained to do that one yep. job. Okay. Yeah. That's because interesting. Then, that makes total sense. Yeah. But interesting. Yeah. If you had, if you were going out and patrolling and scouting. You didn't want a horse that was for that was specific for you know buffalo hunting. Yes. Because they make a lot of noise. Yes. And then you had your horses that were for when wars became about, that were specifically for for wars only, mm. because they really made a lot of noise. Yeah. Because we didn't we weren't like the Hollywood, the Hollywood version of us where we snuck in. <laughs> we wanted people to know that we were coming. Oh, truly. And so the horses had to be able to make that noise as well. Yes. And, and so there was the, everything, everything was all from the ground. Okay. From the but moment was, we were born. But typically it was bareback and a hackamore or bits? Well, or what was? it started out bareback. It started out bareback and majority of the time in rivers. Mm -hmm. and, and water was always a big So is that thing. because they couldn't buck in a river? Is they that couldn't the whole buck reason? real hard, They couldn't yeah. put their head down yep. because of the yep. water. Because I've seen photos and old, not photos, but illustrations and old yep. books. Where, where it was said that the Indians would break their horses in lakes. Yep. So that one, it slows them down the That's water. Right. Two, a horse can't yep. put its head down and buck you off because it fucking drowned, yep. you know what I mean? That's right. And three, if you did fall off, you're in the water. Yep. So is that really true? Yeah, there okay. was, there was a lot of- It makes sense. Yeah, and we had great breeding programs too. 
So when those foals are born traditionally, would they, would you guys get your hands on them? Like traditional, when those colts are born, would you want to touch them? Would you yeah. want to get your hands on them? Yeah. That's how you, I always wondered in the movies, yep. how'd they fucking rope these things? If they're wild horses, no. how'd they get their hands on no, them? No, they were, as soon as they were born, we had hands on them. Yes. And we were part of their lives as they knew that they were going to so be So they grew up ours. with you, I suppose. Yeah, So absolutely. would a traditional, would a traditional... Indian tribe raised their own horses traditionally. Yep. We're going back two or three hundred years now. Yeah. Would they raise their own stock yep. as a general rule? Yeah, and we had our own, like I said, we had great breeding programs and for hundreds of years. Yes. For a very long time. I mean, you look at the Nez Pierce, you look at the Comanche, you mm -hmm. look at the Lakota. I mean, Comanche people, they were a great horse nation. Mm -hmm. And and the, what if you put them on a, like a like different classes, mm. your 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 lowest class of the Comanche people a family would own a thousand head of horses. Mm -hmm. Quanah Parker had over 10,000 head of horses. So horses were kind of valued as currency a little uh, bit, they, they, as, as, as investments. They were, they were, again, they were the angels. And so mm -hmm. the more horses that you had that was in your presence, that was more of a spiritual. Okay. It was a ceremony in yep. itself. I so mean, would, would tribes trade these horses, sell these oh yeah. horses to each other? They trade. They, they trade. trade horses. I mean, like Sitting Bull, well, they wouldn't really trade. They would gift them. Gift them. So Sitting Bull, he Like, had, is it a marriage gift? Two people get married? The husband, no, it was no. just like, you know, just to keep good relations with other bands. Okay. I mean, we didn't... We didn't really war against each other that's back what, then. That's what I really want to ask you. Let me ask you this, yeah. question. let's quit fucking around. The movies always portray that there was a lot of internal war between yeah, no. Indian tribes. Was that really true or no. not? And I hate to be no. ignorant like this, but I don't know. No, mate. I, don't, no, I never grew up in your world. So, right. But as a kid, you'd always see the Indians fighting with each other yeah, or the no. Indians fighting with the cowboys. Yeah. Is that true or is it all bullshit? It's all bullshit. Yes. So oh, pretty bullshit. peaceful as a general rule. That's right. That's, that's interesting. Right. And so that's why horses were great gifts. Yeah. You know, Sitting Bull gift a lot of horses away. I mean, every every camp did. They would gift away horses. If a tri another neighboring tribe was coming by, traveling by, oh, they gifted them horses. You know, to so not, a, not their an aggressive culture. No. Okay. That's right. With 300 and something nations, everybody is a general Over 500. Rule. 500. Everybody's yeah. trying to somewhat get along. Is right. that the general, is that the truth? Exactly. That's very interesting. Exactly. I did not know that. If we were aggressive people, trust me, Columbus wouldn't have lasted more than 10 <laughs> feet upon our shores. That's a good point. That's a good point. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't even have a word in our, in, in any of our traditional languages, we don't even have a word that describes war. Yes. You know, and so we were always the people that we were very diverse. Mm -hmm. You know, we understood that the higher power created everything and everything had a purpose. Yes. And so we had to find that, un understand that purpose to be able to maintain a respect for, the, for mm -hmm. whatever it is that we're looking upon. Yes. Yes. Or looking at. And so including people. Yes. You know, yeah. always, we're always been a loving, compassionate, welcoming people. Mm -hmm. You know, and we still are that way today. Yes. There's yes. still quite a few of us left. Yes. So do you think there's a new uh, fresh air coming into your nations as far as kids wanting to learn what you know and, uh, and embracing it? Do you think there's a second wave coming where young people don't want this stuff to die out? Yeah. I think that you feel an excitement I, there? I feel I feel that we are starting to gain traction again in the excitement of what it is to be who we are yes. again. Yes. What are some things, if any, but I'll just ask, what are some things, if, you, if they are true, that you can say have been lost a lot? Have languages been lost? Certain traditions been lost? What, what has been lost, if anything, in, in the last couple hundred years? What's been really lost for us the most is community. Okay. Is the understanding of community. Because even when I was a kid, we had a great community. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and regardless, because in, on our reservation, I grew up not far from where the Wounded Knee occupation began, and it was in 73. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a bit of a division yep. on our reservation. We had our, our non traditionalists and our traditional people. Okay. And, and so, and as I was going through my life and my young life, that separation began to to fade away and we were coming back together oh, and again as a people yeah and now again unfortunately due to to uh substance abuse mm -hmm. um yes. there's been some separation disconnect again, again. Yeah. 
And, and so now we're, we're starting to see a resurgence uh, through our Sundance ceremonies and other ceremonies that our young people are now beginning to reoccupy. And, and rodeo is part of, you know, I consider rodeo uh, somewhat of a ceremony for our people because when it was it's okay for our people to compete, the thing with that was that that's how the tribes back then utilize that moment to stay in communicate in contact yes. with one another mm -hmm. to keep those relationships strong yes. you know and so there's that resurgence too that we're trying to bring back to our young people and let them know mm -hmm. hey being an indian cowboy is a cool thing yes yes yeah, that is cool <laughs> yes because it was at one point and it can right. get back to it again that's right yeah. that's right well you know the bottom line is this in my personal opinion I don't give a fuck what color you are, what race you are. There's good and bad humans in everybody. That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. Uh, there's good and bad in everybody. And right. and that is is what it is. Okay. Absolutely. There's good and evil. Number two, I think the majority of people in the world want to get the fuck along. They, yep. They're busy raising their families. They want to keep their, their sons out of jail and they want to keep their daughter off the pole. Yep. And they just want to raise some good kids. That's right. Are there some racist piece of shits out there? Absolutely. Yep. Are there some shitheads out there? Absolutely. Right. But I think as a general rule, there's a hell of a lot more good people that want to fucking get along. That's right. Except the ugly people seem to get a little more attention. Right. Through doing ugly things. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. But the one common denominator that fucks up every race is drugs and alcohol. Yep. Yeah. You know, you know I was I mean? asked one time. An individual said, if the government gave your tribe $10 billion, would that help your people? Mm -hmm. I said, absolutely not. Yeah. All it would do is create 10 billion more problems. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, because in what we have, what we, what, what, what we need, what is going to be necessary for us to heal, it is free. Mm -hmm. It is our culture. Mentorship. Yep. Yes. Mentorship. Yeah, so, getting yeah. people busy. That's right. Yes. Getting people right. busy and staying away from the drugs and the alcohol yep. is a big deal. You're yep. exactly right. Money won't fix it because yep. that's what the government does in Australia. They throw money at the problem thinking right. it's going to fucking work and it's no. not going to work. No. It'll never work. You know what I mean? That's they, right. they think that money will solve the situation. It won't solve the situation. That's right. Yeah. And also, I, I, people, in my opinion, Mo, they have to be part of their own rescue. Yep. You can have somebody help rescue you, but you got to grab a hold of the life raft That's right. and kick and try to get back That's to the boat. Right. That's right. You can't rescue somebody if you don't want to be fucking rescued. That's exactly it. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? So regardless, that's a human thing. I don't think that's a race thing. No, that's it's a not. fucking human thing. That's right. You know, there's, there's just as many shitty white people as black people as Indian people as Asian people. Yeah. But, it's, it's, but I think there's a lot more good people out there than what the media want you to believe there is. I absolutely I personally agree. think the media are a bunch of shit stirrers. Yeah. And they like stirring the fucking pot. That's right. And and creating tension where there's a lot, there's a general rule, not a lot of tension there. <laughs> That's right. You know what I mean? No, uh, now, I are there shitty individuals? You're damn right they are. Yeah. But, but as a general rule, I think most people want to get along and support each other. And even people on social media, the ugly ones, that they get a lot more attention because of social media, it spreads. But it's still only one fucking person. Yeah, that's Keep exactly that in mind. it. So you know, the social media can focus a lot more on the negatives than what it does right. the positives. You know right. what I mean? So Mo, before we finish, um, if you could go back to a twenty-year-old Mo, I'm not saying you'd listen because I probably wouldn't listen. At that age, we're full of piss and vinegar. We think we rule the world. We think our parents are dumb, and the older we get, the smarter they get. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now we think our parents are the smartest people in the world, but. Right. If you could go back and give yourself some advice, a 20-year-old Mo, what would you tell yourself? Man, honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell myself anything because in everything I've ever been through is who I am today. Okay. Even you the know. bad choices, yep. even the bad mistakes? Yep. Yep, yep. because in they, they're part of that molding. Yes. You know, and so if there's anything that I would like to tell myself back then, I probably should tell myself now. Yes. That's and great. So. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, every bad mistake you learn something from, don't That's you? That's right. That's right. Yes. You know, and it makes you who you are. Yes, it does make you who you and are. So, you got to get a few bloody bl bloody noses to figure out how the playground works. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Right. Well, I've really enjoyed hearing your story. Uh, I, I'd like to be able to uh, keep following your career. If Maybe in another year or two, if you've got some other interesting projects that you've been working on, please come back and share them with us. 
I, I think we're both in the same boat, and, and most people in the Western industry, there's a, there's a big debt that's owed to Taylor Sheraton for doing what he's done to make the Western lifestyle fun, successful, cool. Yeah. And it seems like it's working in your nations as well. That's you right. You know what I mean? And, in, and, and, it's, and it's bringing Hollywood to, to country people and, and bringing us all together. So that's there's right. a lot of good things. I think it's an exciting time to be alive. Yeah. I think there's an exciting time for young people. Again, if you're a young person want to get ahead, Now's the time to do it. That's right. Because your peers are laying down on you. That's right. Just That's get up right. earlier. Go to bed later. Start right. work harder. That's right. You'll outshine them. Yeah, have That's you ever right. heard that fucking, uh, have you ever heard that clip of Dana White? You know, Dana White that runs yeah. the UFC? Yeah. There's a clip on TikTok or somewhere that he says, to, he says something about, I tell my kids all the time, if you're even remotely a savage today, you're just going to mow them down. Yeah. If you're, he tells me, he says, I tell my kids all the day, if you're even remotely a savage individual, you're going to mow them down because we've, we've just got such pee-hearted kids now, but just got no fucking backbone to them yeah. that if you've got a backbone and you've got some aggressiveness to you and you want to go rule the world, it's at your feet. That's right. Go get it. <laughs> That's right. Go get it. You know what That's I mean? Right. I interviewed a girl the other day and get, she gave me a big speech about wanting to be in my company and she wanted to be me and, 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 and do what I do. And she could talk really well, and I said, that's all great, but your words mean fucking nothing to me. That's what, right. what I pay attention to is your actions. Right. Show me you want to be me by what you do. That's what right. What your lips do mean literally nothing to me. <laughs> nothing at all. That's right. What your actions, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so far the girl's doing real good, but, but it's, not, it's not being tested yet either. Yeah. Somebody yeah. said to me the other day, that girl's doing real good. I said, yeah, but she ain't tired yet. Yeah. She ain't missing home yet. Yeah. She ain't dirty yet. Yeah. You know, I want to, you got to see their right. character when things get ugly. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You got to see when it gets yeah. ugly, yeah. where their true character right. comes out. Right. If you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. And if you don't, you'll find an excuse. That's right. Well, Mo, cheers to you, brother. Cheers I to really you I really enjoyed brother. this. It's been a fun story. I wish you the best of success of what you're doing. Please keep in contact with me. I will. And, and if I can help you with horsemanship or horses, I'm here. But I really want to follow your career and what you're doing and, and what Taylor's doing with the whole Western industry. It sounds wonderful. And thank you so much, Clinton. It's a great honor to be here sitting across from you. Well, thank most you. Definitely. Well, thank you. So cheers, thank you very much, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Today's episode was filmed and produced by Intercut Productions, marketing by Stuart & Associates, and organized and administrated by Down Under Horsemanship. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button and leave a rating. Follow us and stay up to date on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. See you next time, mate. Cheers.